Good morning and welcome to Parkview Christian Church. Uh, it's good to be together this morning and we invite you uh, to join us in worship today.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above me. Oh, 
struck wonder at the mention of your name. Hey, I want to welcome everybody here to Parkview Christian Church this morning. And uh, in just uh, in a few seconds here, the guys are going to be passing out some of the, uh, the offering, uh, the, uh, the cups for the offering with the bread on the bottom. Just want you to hold on to that as we uh, get ready to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And if you're a guest with us today, we just want to welcome you. We want to thank you for being here. We want you to know that if you're a believer in Christ and you put your faith in Him and been baptized into Christ and, and all of that, even if you're not a member of our church, we would just uh, love for you to participate with us as we remember the Lord in communion. And, um, and uh, so we, uh, we appreciate you being here. Also want to let you know that in the pews in front of you, you'll probably see a card that says connect on it. And uh, if it's turned around, it'll say welcome on the other side. But on that particular card, you can fill that out and let us know you were here. If you want to if you want to connect with us and, uh, and kind of be a little bit more of a part of what goes on here at Parkview Christian Church, you can uh, fill out your name and your email and your phone, and, and then uh, we'll be able to connect with you that way, and, and you can get involved a little bit easier. But on that card, there's a place for a uh, prayer request. If you've got something that you would just like us to pray for, you don't have to put your name on it or anything. You can just write that prayer request down, and today you can throw that card in the offering. Or you can leave it in your seat as you go, and we'll pick it up later. Uh, But we gather those cards up on Monday morning, and we get in the office, and we pray for those prayer requests. Whether we know who wrote it down or not, we pray for those prayer requests on Monday. And so I just want you to know that uh, you're invited to do that. You're invited to let us know how we can pray for you. And, uh, and if you just fill it out with your name and all that, we're going to just pray for you in general. So we're just, you know, whatever the Lord needs to do in your life, we're going to we'll just pray for you in general. So uh, we'd like to pray for you this week if there's anything that's on your heart or going on in your life and, and uh, that you would just uh, appreciate some prayer for. And there's a, even a little box that says, check here if we have your permission to send uh, text notifications. And down at the bottom it says... Check here to ask the whole church to pray for it. So if, uh, if you want us to text you from time to time to let us know what's going on, you can check that box. If you want us to tell everybody about your prayer request so they'll all pray this week, we can do that too. Yeah, check that box. Otherwise, we're just going to pray for, pray for you in the office. Right now, we want to go to God in prayer. Last week, we asked, uh, we asked just for praises, just things that we can praise the Lord about. And there were all kinds of things that we could praise the Lord about last week. It was really encouraging and uplifting. And uh, today, I want to, again, I want to ask, what can we praise the Lord about? But I also want to, want to ask, uh, what, what do you need prayer for today? So for just the next few moments, we've got some guys with some microphones that can pass them around. And we need to do that so the people online especially can hear. And we also want to invite those who are online. We want to invite them, invite all of you who are watching us online. If you've got a prayer request or you got something to praise the Lord about, just type it in the comments. The guys in the back are watching that. Um, just type it in the comments and uh, let us know how we can pray for you, or just let us know how you'd like to praise the Lord today. And uh, so for us who are together this morning in this room, how can we praise God? What, what is there that we can praise Him for this morning? And what might you need prayer for? Just raise your hand and they'll come to you. We've got a lot of things we can praise the Lord about.
My bad. No problem. We have a fan in our biking group who has a 35-year-old son named Daniel who's at Barnes Hospital with cancers being removed this week. Okay. 35-year-old uh, Daniel who's getting cancer removed at Barnes. That's up around St. Louis. I don't know if you've ever been to Barnes. That is a labyrinth of a hospital. Big. Any other requests or praises? Yes. Um, we have a, a praise that uh, Randy came through everything good, and he's back here with us today. Yeah. And Absolutely. then uh, Jared uh, Freeman sent a text in to me earlier saying that, and to the church account, saying that he is uh, in urgent care. Their daughter is having an ear issue. So prayers for their little daughter right now. Brianna. Brianna. Thank you. Okay. Hey, yes. You won't remember him, but years ago there was a guy named Eric, a Chinese student that I taught to drive. I apologize for that up front. But, <laughs> uh, he texted me from New York the other day that his hearing is in April for his citizenship, for, uh, and it looks pretty positive that he will get it. So Awesome. Way to go. That's got to be a relief for him. Got one right up here. Yeah, Donna's uh, cous cousin, but just uh, passed away here. We, he's about the same age as Donna was, but they thought everything was going good for him. He, he couldn't breathe real good. To put him on an inhaler, and he was breathing, and all of a sudden, they, they took him off for a while, and there was some kind of medication. They don't know yet what it was they gave him. Within a day, he passed away, just like that. So that was... Deal. And then also, Dale, my friend from uh, Hamilton, Iowa, Dale Jensen, has always been my close friend. He's, his cancer is kicking up again more. And he's got a lot of help, and a lot of people have come in and help him, but, but uh, he's, uh, he's not, he's, I just pray so much that everything will come one way or another for him, because we've been so close all these many years. Okay. You, you said it was Donna's cousin? Yeah, my cousin uh, passed away. He... Put, they put him on a new medicine, mm -hmm. and 2% of the people that take it have mm. problems, and he was one of the 2%. I see. And mm -hmm. so it caused him not to be able to breathe. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I would like prayer for Richard Hobbs, uh, Laura Hobbs, which many of you know here, a, a very dear friend. Um, her father, Richard, has been going through cancer for several years, but he's probably in the last few days of life here, uh, a faithful servant of God and uh, their whole family. So just continue to, to lift them up as they walk through this, uh, the ending of life here. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for their prayers. My mother seems to be doing better, so I appreciate that very much. Amen. We can praise God for some beautiful weather today, can't we? Amen. Amen. We got I have a praise. Um, yeah. I have one of my duties at school is working the lunchroom, which... As I have shared many times, it is not my favorite duty. But what I do love is the conversations that I have with children. Yeah. And I've had two very serious conversations, or funny conversations, however you look at it. It amazes me how children know God. It's just in them to know God. And one of them was about the great big battle at the end of the, who's going to win? Is it going to be Jesus or is it going to be Satan? And I just love that. But I, so that's my praise is that how children just know God. My prayer request is for my daughter's family, the Houchins family. My little grandson a couple weeks ago broke his arm and he's supposed to get his cast off on Friday. My daughter is having surgery on her arm on Friday and she'll be in a cast from her hand to her shoulder. And my son-in-law tore his ACL completely, and he's going to have surgery on March 14th. So we're going this weekend to help out. 
<laughs> so just keep them in your prayers. Okay. All right. If that's uh, if that's what we if that's uh, if that's everybody, we will go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we have so many things that we can praise you for today. We just thank you, Father, for being here uh, in our midst. We thank you, God, for the church family you surround us with. We thank you, Father, for the love and the joy that we get to experience here in this building together and just uh, being together as we worship you. Uh, Father, we want to lift up some uh, pray. We want to lift up some prayers to you as well, Lord. We want to ask that you would uh, watch over Daniel as he's. Um, being taken care of as they're working on uh, him for, with cancer. And I pray, God, that you'll be with the doctors and the nurses who are watching over him and working on him. And I pray, God, that you will guide their eyes and their hearts and their minds. Lord, help them to prescribe the right treatments and to do the right procedures. I pray, God, that you would give them success. I pray, God, that he would be able to get free from that cancer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for Randy and bringing him through. Um, Lord, uh, the, the stuff that he was dealing with, Lord, and we just thank you, Father, for working with the doctors and nurses for him and Father, for giving him some, uh, helping him to recover from all of that and to get past it. Lord, we pray for uh, Jared and his, uh, his daughter. Lord, we pray for Brianna, Brianna who's uh, in urgent care today. And we just ask, Lord, that you just watch over her. And, and uh, Lord, you just take care of her and help her father to recover and to just have relief, uh, Father, from, uh, from what she's dealing with as well. Lord, we, uh, we want to praise you for Eric. Thank you, God, for... Uh, for, uh, for this time that he can finally come to the end of this road where he can get his citizenship and, Father, have this hearing. And, Lord, I know these things go so, so slow, but, Lord, thank you for getting him so far. And, and I pray, God, that it would just conclude well. I pray, God, that he'll be able to uh, have that citizenship that he's been seeking. Um, Father, I just, we just want to lift up uh, Donna's cousin to you, Lord, uh, the whole family and all of the loved ones uh, in, uh, around, around her cousin. I pray, God, that you would just give them comfort and peace, Father, right now as they deal with his loss. And Lord, I pray for, uh, I pray for Dale dealing with cancer. I pray, God, that you would just continue to be with him and watch over him, and Lord, and give him strength and, and relief. Father, we just thank you for the people you've put in our lives that make such a huge example and, and, and inspire us so much. And Lord, we want to thank you for Richard and, and just the example that he's been in his family and to, and to people and uh, to be uh, following you all these years. And Lord, as he comes um, to, to maybe the end of the road, we pray, God, that, uh, that this time you would just give this family comfort and, and joy. And Lord, thank you for the hope that he has. Thank you for the hope that the family has, Lord, knowing that um, we never really say goodbye. We just say, see you later. And Father, we just thank you for that. And Lord, we want to thank you for, uh, for the kids that you put in our, in our path and in our life. And, uh, and Father, just the faith that they have and the joy that they give us. And uh, Father, we just want to lift up um, a family to you right now, Lord, who's dealing with all kinds of medical things going on with their loved ones and, and, uh, and people in the family. Lord, we pray for the surgeries. We pray, God, um, uh, for the recoveries. And we pray, God, that you would just watch over them and, and give them strength. And uh, Lord, uh, give them peace about all these things. And Lord, I pray that they'll, everyone will recover and, and be able, Father, to, uh, to, uh, to get back uh, into life and normally, Father, as, as soon as possible. We just thank you, God, that you're with us through all these kinds of things. We thank you, God, that you never give up on us. We thank you, God, that you're here this morning. And uh, we lift all this up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. morning. It's been kind of a thematic week for me, and um, while many of you may think it's because of the Chiefs, it's not. It's, it's more of a, a spiritual thing for me this week. It's, it's been one of those reminder messages. I don't know whether you're Facebook friends with Brian, but he posted a message about the church, and, and some of the the difficulties some churches have in 
being and speaking the gospel message. And it's kind of funny because another friend of mine from up in Illinois was posting at the same time about church leaders who have fallen. And his question was, who's going to step up? Who's going to step up and be the leader that they need to be? And it just kind of reminded me of what we've been talking about for the last several weeks in Romans. And it, it reminded me of a, of, of a verse that we specifically looked at in, in the scripture we looked at last week. And it just kept coming back to that thought. And I just want to share it with you this morning. Because of this, we've had blessings. We, Brad was a great minister. Brian is a great minister. But we can't put our faith in our ministers. We can't put our faith in the church itself. There's only one place that we need to put our faith, and it was reminded to us last week in Romans chapter 8. It says, What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. It goes on down in verse 37. It says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, before Brian came, we had this message series called, But God. And I've always described Romans this way. Chapters 1 through 7 are sin, 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 sin. You, here's all the mess ups that we do. And chapter 8 flips the script and says, but Jesus. All these things that we struggle with in life. But Jesus came, lived among us, died for us and rose again. All the things that we try to put our faith in all pale in comparison to Jesus. The author and perfecter of our faith, the one who gave his all for us. Anything we put our life and, and faith in beyond that is empty. But Jesus... So this morning as we come to our time of communion, I just want you to think about that. Everything around us, if you look at the, what's going on in politics, if you look at what's going on in the world, everything around us speaks of destruction and misery. But Jesus came in our, into our lives, gave up his for us. Or your sin. Let's remember that this morning as we take this morning. I'm going to pray and then you can take. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to just stop in the middle of everything that's going on and remember that you are who we are to put our faith in. Everything else is empty. Everything else is vain. Everything else only leads to destruction. But you came into our lives, came into this world and gave up your, your, your life for us so that the sin that's in our lives can completely be removed away. So as we take this cup this morning, Jesus, and we take this bread, it's reminding of us of the sacrifice you gave. Help us to remember that in all of this, but Jesus, Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. In your name I pray.
Amen. Appreciate the praise team this morning, don't you? Amen. I tell you. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, just a couple of things in your bulletins today. In your bulletins today, I jumped a gun on one announcement. Um, I'm going to have, uh, we, I, I was planning on it and didn't get it done. Um, we're going to have some, um, uh, some cards in the lobby next week. You'll see those. And uh, jump in cards. You'll see those next week. And it's just kind of a way if you want to get involved in some of the ministries that are going on with our church and some of the things that are happening and you just want to jump in and participate, um, those are going to be in the lobby next week. So I jumped the gun a little bit, but uh, I just gave you a sneak peek. That's all I did. And, uh, but also in your bulletin today, there's an insert. And you'll notice the insert says halftime Bible study. And uh, because uh, there's some game or something going on today, and uh, I was actually planning on wearing a Kansas City Chiefs shirt because I actually have one, and, uh, and I put it on this morning, and I found out I need a new one because I got a stain right in the front of this thing, and uh, so I couldn't wear it today, so I did the best I could. I've got Chiefs colors on, and, uh, so, and, and I, I looked to see if I had a Chiefs tie. I didn't have a Chiefs tie, so I've got a Cowboys tie, but they're not ever going to be in the Super Bowl, so I mean, you know... But uh, so I did the best I could. But this particular Bible study, it's for you, whatever house that you might happen to be in, whether you're at home or with a bunch of friends watching, um, wherever you happen to be, when halftime rolls around um, or, or when you just get a chance during the during the game just to kind of take a break. Um, that there's a halftime Bible study for you and everyone in the home uh, to just kind of participate in. And so um, you can just uh, do that wherever you happen to be and whoever you happen to be with. And I just want to encourage everybody um, to maybe just take the time for that. Also planning on putting a thing, uh, a video up on Facebook this afternoon. It should go up about halftime, uh, right at halftime. And you can watch that as well if you'd like to. And, uh, and uh, so we just invite you to, uh, to just enjoy your evening tonight, and uh, we just want to encourage you to uh, maybe take a moment and uh, spend some time in God's Word while you're at it. It's going to be an interesting uh, Super Bowl. I, I like to, um, at this time, I like to uh, take a commercial that's going to be on the, on the Super Bowl. They, they usually put those online uh, a day or two ahead of time, and so you can get a sneak peek of several of the commercials that are going to be on the Super Bowl, and they're always the craziest and most expensive commercials you can buy, so they put a lot of work into them, and this year there is a Christian group that has been making commercials, and it's talking about Jesus, and it's introducing the world to Jesus, and so um, I want you to see a, a Christian commercial um, that, uh, that this group is doing. This is, um, I don't know if this commercial is going to be at the Super Bowl or not, but this group is going to be airing some commercials tonight, um, and it's called He Gets Us. And uh, here's one of the commercials they've aired uh, during some recent football games. So here we go. Get some sound, maybe. Boy, Lisa. says Jesus was wrongly judged and he gets us. And it was kind of relating um, just life to Jesus and his disciples when they were here on this earth. And a lot of people judged them. And uh, a lot of people um, just came to wrong conclusions about what Jesus and and all his followers were up to. And they, they didn't really pay attention to what they were actually doing and they, what, the things that he was actually teaching. And, uh, and, and this commercial says Jesus was wrongly judged. You might feel wrongly judged. Jesus was also wrongly judged. And it says he gets us. And so these commercials, they are, they're aimed at people who don't know Jesus. They're aimed at people who maybe don't really quite understand uh, what faith in Jesus or what church or what all that stuff is really all about. And so they're trying to, to help people get to know Jesus, not just know about Jesus. It's not a history lesson, really. 
I mean, that wasn't really what it looked like when Jesus walked on the earth. But they're trying to, to, to help people understand and get to know the character of Jesus and the character of God and understand God's heart. That's really what they're trying to do. And so they've come up with some commercials, and I'm kind of looking forward to seeing what they come up with tonight. Um, but what they're doing is a real, it's, it's a real thing that we all kind of wrestle with sometimes, just trying to understand God. I mean, it's easy enough to open the Bible and read what it says happened. It's easy enough to, to understand, here's what the Bible says happened, here's what the Bible says God did. But then to just understand those things, because there are times when we have big questions, when, when we need to, to wrap our brain around what God is doing and what God is not doing, and, and, and we have all these questions that swirl in our heads too, just like anybody in the world might. And, and so we, sometimes we want to know the character of God and His motivation and, and, and just the why question. I mean, what, what about all the people on the earth who have never heard about Jesus? What about them? That's a big question. Why, why does God allow all the suffering to go on right now? Why do people go through some of the things that we were praying about um, this morning? Why, why does those things happen? Those are big questions. Does God care? Is He arbitrary? Does He decide who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't? I mean, those are big questions that we wrestle with sometimes. So that we need more. We need to get a little bit deeper than just on the surface of, of a history lesson. We want to know why. We want to know what God was up to. And, and so when you run into Romans chapter 9, which is where we're going to be going this morning, when you run into Romans chapter 9, you got to understand that for a long time now, for about, well, we've divided it up into eight chapters. You know, when they wrote the letter, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't in chapters or verses. He just wrote a long, long letter. It's kind of like opening Facebook and somebody sends you a message and you realize that they just sent you a really long message and you have to scroll and scroll and scroll and, you know, and you feel like, oh, my goodness, this is going to take me forever to read it. You, you probably would have felt that way back, in, back in, in Bible times if you'd have got this letter from Paul. It's Romans. We've divided it up into 16 chapters. And, and here we get to chapter 9. We're, we're just past halfway. And he's been talking about what God has done with Jesus and how, how he's led up to, to all of this that Jesus has done on the cross, that we can put our faith in him, that we can follow him. And so he's talked about all of this. But that leads to questions. That leads to some big questions. Especially if you were Jewish, especially if you were an Israelite, it leads to some really good questions. I mean, all that stuff that God had done with Israel for thousands of years, all the stuff that God did with Israel in the Old Testament, was that all for nothing now? Because you did seem, it does seem that it kind of gives you this sense that. The religion that Israel had been following was suddenly the wrong religion. I mean, if you can imagine being an Israelite in that time, and then all of a sudden that now I need to do something different so that a year ago I was saved, but now I'm not saved anymore. I mean, those are some big questions. How do you reconcile that? How do you wrestle with it? And in Romans chapter 9, and really and in chapter 9 and chapter 10 and chapter 11, He's answering these big questions. What about Israel? What about all the stuff that God had done in the Old Testament? And it doesn't matter anymore. And, and one of the reasons why this is so important for you and me is that we have big questions too. And sometimes we want to wrap our brain around what God is doing and what it all means. In Romans chapter 9, verse 3, you can kind of see where he's going and he's talking to the Jewish people, and he's talking about the Jewish people, and he says in verse 3, he says, for I wish, Paul says, I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the benefit of my brothers and sisters, my own flesh and blood. You know, Paul was Jewish too. He was, he, he was educated as a Pharisee. He followed the Jewish law, and he had a heart for his people who it seems like in this moment are kind of getting left behind. 
They'd been God's people, but now are they really God's people anymore? Verse 4, it says, They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service, and the promises. He says in verse 5, The ancestors are theirs, and from them the physical descent came, came the Christ, who is God over all, praise forever. I mean, they've had all of this history with God. They've had all of these things that God has done in their midst and done in their history. And now all of a sudden, everything's changing. And the real people of God were now the church. So you can imagine if you were were Jewish and a year ago, you were right where God wanted you to be, but now you're not. You have some big questions. We have big questions too. So trying to understand God is something that that we kind of have in common with them. We want to wrap our brain around what the Bible is saying and what it's teaching so that on some level it just makes sense to us. And we can understand God a little bit more. And, And when we dig deep and when we ask those kinds of questions, the more we understand God, the more we know how to respond to Him in the right ways. And so sometimes wrestling with these questions helps us grow in our faith more than ever before because the more we understand, the better we understand God, the better we can respond to Him in right ways. So as we look in chapter 9, it, it is theological. It is deep. It gets into some pretty big subjects, but I think we can sum it up by saying three things. I think we can say God works His plan. Everybody say God works His plan. God works his plan. And and God knows his people. Everybody say, God knows his people. people. And then I think the last thing is I can respond. Say, I can respond. respond. Those are three things that I think are in this chapter. God works his plan. God knows his people and I can respond. As deep as this gets theologically, those are truths that were true for them that are true for us. I want to talk about the first one. God works his plan, number one. In church, we would probably say that God knows what he's doing. And I think most of us, if I were to say that, if I were to preach it, most of you would would agree. You'd say amen or yep, yep, or at least you'd think it. You know, you'd agree. He's got a plan for my life. He's got a plan for the world. And most of us would say, well, the Bible teaches this or the Bible teaches that. God's got a plan and I've got my interpretation of it. Amen. (laughs) I do. I've got my interpretation of it. What happens when my interpretation doesn't quite fit what God does? Then I've got a problem, you know, and and then and then usually we we uh, we wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? You know, when somebody's cooking, I'm not the best cook in the world. I can cook ramen noodles. I can cook uh, macaroni like you wouldn't believe. I'm actually pretty good at grilling hamburgers. I've got a limited menu of stuff that I can do. My wife can make a chocolate pie that is amazing. And it is weird, the stuff that she does to make it work. I mean, it's weird. She has to do certain things at a certain time. Makes no sense to me. And when I see somebody who's cooking something and I see somebody who's working on something or maybe doing a piece of art and, or, or working on a vehicle and, and I don't know how to do what they're doing, I don't sit back and give them instructions. I don't. How crazy would that be? Because they're the one who knows what they're doing. So usually, if anything, I'm just going to sit back and maybe learn a few things. Maybe I can pick up a few uh, little pieces of knowledge there as I watch them, as I watch them do it. But then when God is working his plan and he does something and you know, he's God, he's, he knows what he's doing. He understands he's got this whole thing together. And most of us would say, well, God's in charge. But then when God does something that we don't think is right, we suddenly object think, what in the world are you doing? Sometimes I, I think in our, we, we have our own interpretations and our own ideas, and, and, and we think we're the, we're the experts, but we're not always the experts. God sometimes is going to do things that we don't expect. And I think it was easy for people in Paul's day to ask, well, well what about Israel? Well, what, what, you, what is God doing? And, and so Paul begins to, he begins to try to explain 
and share what God is doing. He says in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Now, it is not as though the word of God has failed. It's not as though the word of God has failed because all, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Even in the Old Testament, just because you were descendant of Abraham didn't mean that you were going to get the promise that God gave Abraham. God says, I'm going to make you the father of a nation and he's going to bless all the descendants from Abraham. But you know, not every descendant from Abraham got included. That wasn't part of the plan. And he gives examples. He says, you know, the Bible says, God's, God says, your offspring are going to come through Isaac. Isaac's not the only son that Abraham had. Abraham had Ishmael too. But God says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to send that promise through Isaac. So even, even in the very beginning when he talked to Abraham, even in the Old Testament, God didn't work out his plan on the, just, you know, for, for everyone. He had a specific plan. He was working his plan. He was doing things the way he wanted to do it. Isaac's wife had a couple of twins, Jacob and Esau. The Bible says Jacob was the one that God says that's the one. He, did, he wasn't going to build his nation out of Esau. He was going to build his nation out of Jacob. That was what God said he was going to do. And so number one on your bulletin in your note section, it says God's word hasn't failed. God's word hasn't failed. He was always going to work his plan and make it work out the way that he intended. He was always going to do that. We don't always get it. And sometimes we have to play catch up. Sometimes we have to say, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I misunderstood something. Sometimes we have to to listen really close. And the Israelites who who might have thought that it's going to be about Israel and God's going to do everything with Israel, they they might not have noticed that in Genesis chapter 12, when God was talking to Abraham, he told them that all the people of the earth, all of the people of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And in Isaiah, where, where God says he was going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And what, what you have to understand is that God's plan from the beginning, it was always going to be global. It was never going to be one group. It was always going to be global. And so it wasn't just for one group and okay, as long as you're in Israel, you're good. It was always going to go this way. God was working his plan so that in Acts, in the book of Acts and in chapter one and verse eight, one of the last things that Jesus says to his disciples before he ascends into heaven, Acts chapter one, verse eight, Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and into the ends of the earth. It was always going to be global, which is why in the book of Revelation, you see standing before the throne of God, people from every nation and tongue and tribe and standing shoulder to shoulder. It is not just one group. It never, never was. There's a, uh, I got a a picture of a pastoral search committee. Uh, A minister put this up. Uh, just this couple of weeks ago, and in the pastoral search committee, you can see them there. They're gathered around the table, and uh, one of them says, basically, we're looking for an innovative pastor with a fresh vision who will inspire our church to remain exactly the same. <laughs> and, and he put that up, and there was quite a few comments from other pastors underneath it going, yep, I understand that, you know, and, 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 and sometimes we just, we don't want change. Sometimes we, we want to just hold on to the stuff that we've really enjoyed. But for God, it's always been global. There's always more people he wants to preach the gospel to. There's always more people that he wants them to know that they are loved and they can be part of his family. And because of that, as good as our church is, we are never satisfied until we got every person on the planet worshiping with us. We're never satisfied until every person on the planet knows that God loves them, that he sent Jesus to die for them. And because of that, we have no idea where God's going to take us. But it's not my plan, it's his. I don't know how big it'll get. I don't know where he's going to send us. But all I know is this, it's God's plan. It's not ours. He's working his plan. And we're along for a great ride. So... We want to stay up in step with him. In Romans chapter 9, verse 14, the Bible, Paul writes this. He says, what should we say then? Is, 
Is there injustice with God? You know, did he just leave Israel behind? Absolutely not. Verse 15, for he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Verse 16, so then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Showing mercy to the Gentiles. They were putting their, you know, the people who were outside of Israel. God was showing mercy to them. They were putting their faith in Jesus. And the truth was just, you know, being an Israelite, that's not going to save you. You need God's mercy. It's bigger than we are. It's bigger than our group. It's bigger than our nation. It's bigger than our church. We just, we need God. We need his mercy. Being an Israelite wasn't enough. You needed God's mercy. Being in our church building, it's not enough. We need God's mercy. Growing up in the United States or growing up in Israel, that's not enough. You need God's mercy. Being around the church, being around, knowing a bunch of Christian things or Bible things, having knowledge, that's not enough. You need God's mercy. We can't earn it. We can't get there ourselves. We need God's mercy because it's his plan and he's working it. In Luke chapter 23, we read a famous story. Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's got a couple of criminals on either side of him. Verse 39 of Luke chapter 23, it says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Next verse, verse 40, it says, But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. Verse 41, he says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then in verse 42, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And verse 43, Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Bottom line was that guy had done a lot of things wrong. You know what he did right? He looked to Jesus for mercy. And we need it too. We can't earn our way anywhere. We just need to look to Jesus for mercy because that is the one thing that can change everything. It's His plan, and we need to turn to Him. In your bulletin, it says God's mercy isn't, there's a blank there, it, it isn't arbitrary. If you don't know how to spell arbitrary, just give it your best shot. Nobody's going to know. It's not arbitrary. It's available, though. It's not arbitrary. It's available. We need to accept, accept God's authority in our life. And, and we need to be serious and sober that just being in church and being around church and, and just because of our past, none of that's enough. We need to be right with God today. We need to accept his authority in our life and and sometimes we can get comfortable and sometimes we can get complacent because we are in church, because we are sort of religious, but we need to be obeying God. We need to be listening to God. We need to be following him. We need to be his people because we need his mercy because none of us in here are good enough to go to heaven on our own merits. None of us in here are good enough to make it without God's mercy through Jesus. And we need to seek God to be in our life today. We need to seek His direction. We need to obey His commands. And we need to conform to His plan. God, whatever you need, wherever you want us to be, however we can serve you, let's serve Him. Because God's going to work His plan. But the other thing I said was that God's not only going to work His plan, but God also knows His people. He knows His people. There are two main, this, I tell you, this chapter especially, there are, this is a huge theological debate that's lasted for 700 years. We're not going to solve it today. Um, but there's two main views. One of them is that God predestines everything. He decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell and everything that's going to happen. And there's really nothing you can do about it. And, uh, and I might be misrepresenting that a little bit. Or maybe I, I should also add that they said God in his sovereign will that's beyond our understanding knows who he's going to pick and who he's going to choose. He knows all of that. That's one view. Everything is kind of predestined. And the other view is that no, God gives people a choice. He gives you a choice. He, he's not going to just, you know, send you to hell be, without giving you that choice. He's going to give you a choice. And so you have these two views that, that have kind of argued for at least 700 years about it. And I think it's more of a both and. I think there's a lot of truth for us to kind of wrestle with. And it's sort of like they're both got some 
some truth to it, and, and, and God's kind of working on both. But let me show you what I mean. I, th- I think, first of all, God knows his people. Look there in verse 17. It says, for the scripture tells Pharaoh. You remember back in the Old Testament in Exodus. For the scripture tells Pharaoh. Moses is going to Pharaoh. You got to let my people go. The scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason, that I may display my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. God was going to do all those plagues of Egypt and and do those incredible miracles. And and here Paul says, you know, the scripture tells Pharaoh, I raised you up for this reason that I may display my power in you, that my name may be proclaimed in the whole earth. It's like (laughs) the reason why you're Pharaoh is because I was going to... uh, show everybody my power. I was going to show everybody my glory. I, I intended to do these plagues all along. And, and it seems kind of unfair to Pharaoh. I mean, what's he going to be able to do about it? Verse 18, it says, so then God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. And if you remember in the story, and if you've never read the story, there's places in there where the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh wouldn't let his people go. And then God would hit him with another plague. And it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he wouldn't let those people go. And God hit him with another plague. Verse 19 of Romans chapter 9. He says, you will say to me, this is Paul speaking. He says, you will say to me, therefore, why then does he, does God still find fault for who can resist his will? Verse 20, but who are you, a mere man, to talk back to God? Will what is formed say to the one who formed it? Why did you make me like this? And when you read this, it's, it really seems like that God's not given us much of a choice. But I think it's both and. I think it's more, uh, God really knows us. He knows our heart. He knows your heart. He knows where you're at. There's no fool in him. It says he raised Pharaoh to be Pharaoh. But I think God knew Pharaoh. I think God knew the kind of person that he was. He made sure that he would become Pharaoh. And it says that he hardened his heart. But you know, if you go back and, and you read the original language, we translated it from the Hebrew and we, we said it means hardened, but it, it literally means in, in most of the words that are used, there's like three of them, but most of them are going to say, and they all really mean this, that God made his heart strong. And it literally what it means, it makes it strong. Because it would have been easy for Pharaoh after seeing God do these incredibly terrifying miracles, sending these plagues. It would have been easy for him to lose heart, but God made his heart strong. He didn't tell him what to do necessarily. He didn't tell him what decision to make, but he did make sure that Pharaoh had enough courage to do what he wanted. Now, if it was said he made his head hard, then when he would, it would have been stubbornness then, you know, but he made his heart hard. He, he, he strengthened his heart so that he wouldn't lose courage and and he, became, and he wouldn't let the people go. He gave Pharaoh the ability to do probably what Pharaoh wanted to do all along. And then in Romans chapter 9, verse 22, it says, And what if God, wanting to display his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience the objects of wrath prepared for destruction? Objects of wrath prepared for destruction. That sounds like God didn't give him a choice. But that's an interesting way to put it. Because when it says prepared for destruction, that means that, well, he's fitting it for destruction. If you've got a King James Bible, it says fitted for destruction. It's the same word they use when they talk about mending a net, repairing it, making it right, putting it all back in order, making it come together, making it complete. And You know, it's like they weren't ready for judgment, so they were being fitted for judgment. That's a weird thing to say, but you know what? You you see it in the scripture. There's a place where God tells Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, but not yet. It's going to be about 400 years before your descendants have this land because the sins of the Amorites, not yet full. Is not yet, they've not yet reached their full measure. They haven't sinned enough. They're not actually ready for judgment yet. He wasn't telling the Amorites what to do in that moment. He was just saying, you know, I'm not going to judge them yet. It's not time. I'm going to let them, I'm going to let them continue for a while. And at some point it's going to be time for judgment. 
And I'm going to give this land to your descendants. But it's not really time yet. There's a place in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11, where it's talking about an antichrist type of figure. And the man of lawlessness, this bad guy talking about this. And it's talking about how bad the world is going to be. And he says something really interesting in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says, And in all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they, the people in the world, perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And then it says in verse 11, For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion. God's going to send them, He's going to allow them to be deluded so that they will believe the lie. Verse 12, So that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Notice how it describes those people. It says they've delighted in wickedness. Notice it says they didn't love the truth. And the Bible says, for this reason, God's going to send them a lie so they'll believe it. Seems a little unfair. You know, what I'm ta- you know what I think God's doing? He's revealing what's already in our heart. See, I have a friend who a, a, was a youth minister, and he worked, for, and I was actually a friend with him, and I was a friend with the senior minister, friend with both of them. And I once asked the youth minister, I said, what's it like to work for him? He wasn't around, so the youth minister could tell me, you know, the honest truth. You know, what's it like to work for him? I wondered, you know, I just did. I wondered. And he laughed, and he says, oh, he gives me enough rope to hang myself. (laughs) Now, I don't know if you know, uh, you know what that means, but uh, it basically just means, you know, you can self-incriminate yourself. You you get, somebody's going to give you the freedom to mess up, and, and, kind of how that, that worked in that church. He, he gave him the freedom and, and, uh, and allowed him to, to fail sometimes. And he says, I gave him, he gives me enough rope to hang myself. Do you remember Jeff Foxworthy? Anybody remember Jeff Foxworthy? Jeff Foxworthy once said, uh, when I was a kid, my parents had a 900 pound television on top of a TV tray. <laughs> he said, my dad's theory was, let him pull it on his head a few times. He'll learn. Sometimes God gives us freedom, and when he does, we sort of expose what's actually in our heart. He let the people, the Amorites, go. He, he, he was going to allow people to believe a lie because it was going to show what was really in their heart. They didn't love the truth. They delighted in wickedness. God knows our heart. He knew Pharaoh's. He knew the Amorites. He knows yours. See, I believe, number three on the bulletin, God's judgment is just. I I don't believe it's unfair. I don't believe it's arbitrary. I believe it's just. I just believe God knows our heart. And if we're going to get anything right, we've got to get our heart right before God. We've got to get our heart right before God. We need to open our heart this morning and to accept God and His guidance and His leadership and His authority. We need to obey His call. We need to be honest with Him. We need to be real with Him because we can't put up a front, not with God. We, can, we might be able to do it at church. We might be able to do it with our friends, but we can't put up a front with Him. He sees right through us. He knows everything about us. I think that we've got to get real and right with Him in the deepest part of ourselves, to give him authority over every part of our life because God is working our plan, his plan and he knows his people. And if we want, to be, we want to be with God, if we want to have eternal life, if we want to have hope, it's not where we're born, it's not all the outward stuff, it's where our heart is at because he sees our heart. He knows it. But that's the thing you see in this chapter is that even though God allowed these people to fail, even though that God knew their heart, even though God was working his plan at the end of this chapter, I can respond. At the end of this chapter, I can respond. God hasn't shut you out so that you can never come follow Him. He's not shut you out so you can never have the promise and the hope. God hasn't shut you out. God has allowed you, wants you to respond. Number four in your bulletin, our choice is faith or trust or belief. Just to to believe in Him, to trust in Him, to hold on to Him. For instance, 
it, it, the Bible here in the end of this chapter starts talking about this in terms of, you know, we can respond. It says that he called us in verse 24. You can look there. It says he called us. It doesn't say that he chose us. It says that he called us. And you know what happens when somebody calls you? You can respond. And we might be sinners and we might have messed things up. But Paul doesn't write here at the end of this chapter, well, there's nothing you can do. There's nowhere in this chapter where, where God says, well, here's a list of things that I need you to accomplish before I'll ever allow you in. God didn't say, I want you to be perfect. I want you to do all these laws. Here's what God says. Turn to me. Believe in me. Trust in me. And you know, you can be really messed up and hanging on a cross, have ruined your entire life, are only going to live for a few moments, but you can still turn to Jesus and put your trust in him. You can't make yourself perfect. You can't undo all the things you've done before. But in that moment, you can just trust Him instead of anything else. Just trust Him. Our choice is faith. Are we going to believe in Jesus or not? And you don't have to be perfect to do that. You don't have to know the future to do that. You just have to trust Him. So at the end of the chapter, it's not a predestination thing that's deciding at all. Although I think God's predestined a lot of things. I think there's no accident that you're here in this room. I think there's no accident that you're part of this church. I think it's no accident. Some of the things that have happened to you, God has been speaking to you through many of those things. I think there's a lot of things that God has worked out in your life and he did it on purpose. But God... I believe, is giving us one choice, and that is whether we're going to trust Him in Him or not. The deciding factor is faith. It's faith. Israel didn't respond in faith, and that was the problem. See, in Romans chapter 9, verse 31, he says, but Israel. Here's the thing about Israel. This is where the big question was. He said, here's the thing about Israel. Pursuing the law of righteousness has not achieved the righteousness of the law. They haven't been perfect. Verse 32. Why is that? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. And then he says in verse 33, as it is written, look, I'm putting a stone in Zion to stumble over, which again seems unfair, but read the whole verse because that stumbling stone is not a what, it's a who. He says, I, I've, I'm putting a, a stone in Zion to stumble over. People are going to trip over this rock. He says, and the one who believes on him will not be put to shame. Jesus is the stone. That was what was tripping up the people in Israel, but Jesus was the stone. He was laying a stone in Zion, in, in Israel, in Jerusalem. But if you trust in him, you won't be put to shame. That stone they stumbled over was Jesus. But he's our choice, whether we're going to turn to him and believe in him or not. Today, we can do that. We can turn to Jesus. We can put our trust in him. Every day, starting right now, we can just begin to believe and trust in him. When you get baptized, it's, it's, you, you, you know, it's kind of scary because you got to come up in front of everybody. you got to sort of put yourself out there. And if you're going to go underwater. You'll come up. You'll be wet. You know, your hair won't be like it used to be. But, but when we do that, we're not trusting in ourselves. We're just trusting in Him. We're trusting Him with our life. And, and we might feel uncertain about where that's all going to lead. But, and, and it might be easier to trust in just the way we've always been doing things and trust in our old habits and trust in our old sins or just stay in the same place. That's what the people in Israel could have done. Let's just stay right here. This is what we're used to. But God was asking them to trust Him and to follow Him. And that's why everything had changed. Because God was requiring them to, to take that next step and to trust Him. Just like coming out of Egypt, just like following him tomorrow, it always takes faith to trust God. He's going to work his plan. He's going to know his people. But I can respond. I can come and follow him. I think he gets us, as the commercial says. 
but we can get him if we'll put our trust in him. So I invite you to do that today. We're going to sing this the last song, and when we do, you can meet me right up here on the front. And if you want to put your faith in Jesus and be baptized into Christ, you can do that today. Let's stand and sing. I feel really uncomfortable in church this morning. I personally do not like to wear licensed wear or things advertised things to church, but this morning I am. Rightfully so, right? I, I told my wife last night I was I, as kind of an illustration. I was going to bring all of my cheese wear this morning, but I did. I decided not to because I didn't think you guys wanted a 15-minute offering devotion. <laughs> She's. <laughs> No, really, it would only be 13 minutes. Um, no. <laughs> you know, the Bible says some words in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 22. It says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust will not destroy. And it ends in chapter 21 by saying, or verse 21 by saying, for where your heart is, there your treasures will be or where your treasures is, there, where your, there, there your heart will be. Sorry, I got the backwards. But I mean, it kind of reminds me of, of, of this. I spend a lot of money on chief stuff. I spend a lot of money on cardinal stuff. But I hope that if you looked at my finances, you would see 
that my treasure and my heart really is in God. That you would see my finances resembling that. And my challenge to you this morning is just exactly that. Brian just talked about the heart and where our heart is. My question to you is, where is your heart? If I told you that I, I, I went forward this week, I, I, I went into the future. I got to see tomorrow. If I told you the Chiefs win 45 to 14, what would you say? <laughs> if I told you the Chiefs win 45 to 14, what would you say? Yeah. Right. Let me tell you this. I've read the end of the book. Jesus wins. Where is your treasure? Where is it? Where is your heart? Where is it? Only you can answer that question. So this morning, that's my, that's my devotion to you about your treasure, your, your money, your monetary. Where, if I looked at your bank book, where would it show your heart is? And I'm not saying it's just Parkview. I'm, not just, I'm just saying where is your heart when it comes to what you give your time and effort and money towards? Only you can answer that question. This morning we were giving an offering. You can do it online. You can do it in the plate. You can do it, you know, hand it to Rick. I don't care. Wherever you want to do, where is your treasure to show where your heart is? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we get to just worship you in many different ways. We worship you in song. We worship you in reading the Bible and hearing messages about you and studying your word. We also worship in ways that we give our monetary means and our time and our effort to show who we are. Right now, we just ask you to take and, and use this monetary we give back in worship to you to build your kingdom. Not necessarily build Parkview, but just build your kingdom. Your kingdom. Not ours, yours. And we thank you for everything you've given us up to this point to help us in that, in that journey that we have. Father, go with us as we leave here this morning and help us to not only uh, root for the chiefs, but also re root for you and show the world who our heart really is after. Let us be like David and where you look at him and say, he's a man after my own heart, not because of who he was, but for who he sought after. Thank you again for who we are and who you are, that we're your children and you're our Savior. Thank you. Amen. Okay, do we have any announcements today? We do have our drum and rhythm therapy class on Tuesday at 3.30, as well as, since that's Valentine's Day, there is a meal and trivia night at 6. If you are planning on going to that, it is free, but they need to know today so they know how much food to prepare for that. So that's this Tuesday. And I think Art has an announcement. Let's get you a mic. Meeting is going to be at 1 o'clock, regardless, regardless of what you might have heard earlier. So 1 o'clock, we'll be here at board meeting. It'll be over by 5. <laughs> and Sue is making lunch on Wednesday. We're having taco soup. Okay, lunch Wednesday, 11 to 1. Any other announcements? Okay, we invite you to join us in this last song. Uh, let Jesus shine through you this week as you um, just meet the needs and love other people.